this could be detrimental to a good portion of people in our industry if they choose not to change. If some of you haven't sat down and really thought through this and you're seeing this for the first time, this is gonna be a shock. Real estate agents, welcome back to the RMG Agent Podcast. I'm your host, Reed Moore. As always, you can go to rmgagentpodcast.com for all of our episodes, all of our action guides, and you can connect with us there, read our blog, and all of those things. So uh, today, I'm here with my co-host, Jake Bartlett, and what are we going to talk about? Today, we are going to talk about uh, a, a clip from our webinar that's super important for what's going on today. So everybody's hearing the news around the NRR settlement and all that stuff. I think first, before we really you know, dive into what's happening and all that stuff, we need to go back to the history of how we got here. So we dive back into the history of the NAR and the DOJ, um, and the, that goes all the way back to the 1900s, and we, and we hit different points and different key things. Uh, and I think it's really important. I think it is too, right? Because uh, as real estate professionals, we have a narrative. We have maybe some emotions around some of these things that are happening. Um, but when you go back and you look at history, you realize there is a long, long trajectory here of things that maybe are not so new as we think they are. And this is a short episode, but I thought it was worth just cutting this piece out of the webinar we did to help real estate agents get some uh, some context for what's happening because how we all move forward is still a little bit unknown, but where we've come from is very well known, and I think that that's going to be helpful. Yeah, and there's some some really key moments, at least from our careers, that we talk about, like that happened right as we got into the industry or when we'd been into the industry, and things that came from those those moments between the NAR and DOJ that led to changes in our industry that we just think are normal now, but they were drastically different. And they caused lots of uh, yeah. lots of emotional reactions within agents. So I think that's something to really key in on. Yeah. So as always, we're here to impact, empower, and encourage you. And uh, we hope you guys enjoy. It's story time. So here we go. So uh, one of the things that's been sensationalized and is absolutely of massive importance and uh, consideration in our industry are these huge lawsuits that have happened. Right. Right. Yep, have big drastic uh, or maybe not drastic impact on our industry. Yeah, so these are class action, action lawsuits. And the biggest thing about this, of course, is the huge, huge amount of money that it represents. So Sitzer Burnett is the one that really shocked everybody last year, coming out with over $5.3 billion of damages. But these other uh, these other class action lawsuits are that are just the beginning of, of maybe even dozens or hundreds of class action lawsuits, they, they have the potential of being upwards of $400 billion dollars in, in nationwide damages. That's something like four to eight times what our entire industry brings in top line revenue over the course of a year. Yeah. Tremendous amount of money. Right? So you don't have the money to pay that? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have the, I don't have the money okay. to pay that. But here's the thing. Uh, for us today, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. This really has an impact. It really is something that you should be paying attention to, especially if you're at the brokerage level. But we're concerned about some other things that uh, I would say aren't likely things there. This is going to happen. I think it's good information to stay up to date with because you will have clients that will ask you about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So we're going to be focusing on uh, three actors uh, or three dancers that have been dancing now for, what, 80 years? Yeah. Yeah, a little over that. So the first, the first of the actors we're going to talk about today to paint the context is the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice, whether you like them, don't like them, have had good experiences with them, or don't know anything about them, uh, their job in our country is to uh, protect consumers against several things. One is antitrust behavior. Mm -hmm. Another one would be anti-competitive behavior. And then the other one would just be flat out things that are illegal. Yep. Right. So, so the DOJ is is you know they're they're one of the actors in this drama, and then uh, as of kind of this go around, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the current administration has kind of added them into the mix, and and they closely monitor industries like ours, and they really work hand in hand with the DOJ to be able to make sure that there's fair competition happening across different industries. Yep, there to make sure that the the compliance is being happening, and they're really the DOJ's partner in this. Yeah, that's right. So okay, so now on. The, the other side of the dance floor, we have the National Association of Realtors. Now, you could kind of use NAR in this case as uh, as a placeholder for all of us who are in the industry. Mm -hmm. But NAR is, of course, the, the biggest single uh, kind of point uh, of, of uh, 
consolidation in our industry. So NAR started in 1908. Some of the reasons NAR started were because of really bad actors in the real estate space, but they, they had this mission statement originally, and I wanna read it real quick because I think it helps paint some of the context of what we're gonna be talking about. So the original mission statement of NAR was to unite the real estate men of America for the purpose of effectively exerting a combined influence on matters affecting real estate interests. Yep, sounds an awful lot like a union. It sounds a lot like a union. In fact, uh, this would be a traditional union if it was laborers or realtors or real estate agents and a company on right. the other side. The issue, of course, is that we have realtors and real estate professionals and consumers on the other side. So when you put consumers on the other side of, of maybe a statement like this, you have antitrust. Yep. Right? Okay. So now this is not uh, how, you know, this was the original mission. Of course, a lot has changed in NAR, but just kind of painting a picture, this is how we get started and how we end up in this timeline of events where the DOJ, especially, and NAR start dancing. So the dance starts in 1940 uh, with commission fee structures, then sub-agency virtual office websites, uh, the DOJ and NAR dissent uh, decree, and then to, to now, which is the participation rule and cooperative compensation coming uh, under scrutiny. So let's just kind of walk through these, Jake. Yep. All right. So in 1940 to 1970, we've got the commission fee schedule. And what that actually means is that uh, the NAR fixed commissions at 6%. Right. And so we, we had that fixed rate, and uh, that outcome led to antitrust lawsuits through the DOJ and banning fee schedules. Yeah, so a little bit of like context of what was going on in the country. So during this period of time, NAR has a good amount of power, and they just say, hey, it's 6%. Right, regardless of what's going on, that's the deal. The other thing that was happening is, is this is the, the beginning, it's not the beginning, but sub-agency, which we'll get to in a second, was, was a part of this, this time. But what happens uh, kind of historically is when the DOJ gets involved or when things really change, it's not really when things need to change, it's when it affects enough people or has enough of an impact on society to finally warrant the, the focus that is required to be able to produce the change. So then the question is, 1940 to 1970, what is going on in the country that causes this to happen? And there's a few things. So the, the biggest one is if you go before World War II, there were about 300,000 home starts across the entire country. And if you were going to be a homeowner, uh, you had to come to the table with a down payment of roughly 50%. So, so if you look at home ownership, right, and you, like what was the original American dream of home ownership, you have this situation where you have very few people and later in life that could actually afford a home. Well, all of a sudden, all the conquering heroes come back from World War II and our country wants to say thank you for their service, for their sacrifice. And now you have this huge influx of people who had the opportunity to get the GI Bill and to be able to buy houses for very, very little down. Can you imagine going from 50% down to all the way down to, you know, 5 3%, 0%, somewhere in there? Right. But it's drastically different. Changes everything. Yeah. In fact, it changed so much that the industry went from 300,000 home starts to 1.7 million plus home starts into the 50s just a decade, decade and a half later. So if we look at that, we don't have the, like the numbers don't exist to know how many home sales happened. Mm -hmm. But if you can look at that and you can say that the real estate industry over the course of 20 years, you know, uh, went up by what, six or seven times, maybe the, the size that it was previously. Mm -hmm. So you have all of a sudden our industry goes from being kind of a small sideline industry compared to maybe oil and steel and, and other industries at the time uh, to, to now, uh, our industry impacts a huge number of people. And so when you start impacting more people, the practices that show up, in this case, antitrust, anti-competitive behavior, start to show up in the mainstream, and the DOJ steps in and starts the dance and says, hey, you gotta cut it out, you can't do business like this anymore. Yeah, the other thing that happens is gigantic economic growth through the home ownership that we all know now as being a driver for, for, for oh my gosh, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> for your wealth, right? So Yeah, you have huge economic uh, growth just in the country as well as through real estate with this. You have a baby boom, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden the population growth skyrockets. You have uh, suburbanization during this time, massive, massive changes. And of course, this now leads us to the next period of time. Yeah, so uh, 80s and 90s, we've got sub-agency where uh, if, you've, if you've never heard this, if you're newer in the industry, you might not, not 
quite understand this, but uh, all brokers actually represented the sellers. Even the agent that brought the buyer represented the seller as a fiduciary. Yeah. So scrutiny on that uh, collapses the sub, sub agency system and exclusive buyers representations start and you get organizations like uh, NABA, National Association of Exclusive Buyers Agents, who, which I actually used to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you get exclusive buyers brokerages start popping up. Yeah, so you see people who have been around for a while and they talk about working for an exclusive buyer agency or they started that and it was revolutionary, it was bleeding edge. That's because this is the time period that that started happening. Uh, the, the, you know, so, so the DOJ comes along and says, hey, cut it out, you guys can't fix your fee structures. But then the, the uh, practice of everybody being a fiduciary to the seller and causing the buyer to have no representation in the entire real estate profession Right, right. Um, that that all of a sudden is another thing that that comes to light, and and this change starts to get forced. And of course, there were things happening at the national level that uh, that make this uh, the timing for this to start shaking up. Part of this was that there was a savings. It was called the savings and loan crisis. And in broad strokes, the saving and loan crisis was this idea that people were were were. Um, entrusted with savings and loans of the, the average consumer, and they made bad choices, and all of a sudden, this, this group of people that, or you know, the, the banks, the financial institutions that were supposed to be fiduciaries to the money and deeply, deeply trusted, were all of a sudden not found to be trustworthy. Right. Massive uh, breach in consumer, uh, you know, consumer confidence and, and everything. So, so now you have the DOJ looking at real estate and saying, hey, you know, we're here to protect consumers from, you know, could say like predatory type behavior. And then they look at this and they see that we as real estate professionals don't have anybody who is representing the best interests of the buyer. Anybody's so the fiduciary to the buyer. That's right. So now it's time to enforce change again. All right. We're into the early 2000s. Uh, you've got the virtual office websites. And this is when, uh, when NARR starts to try to block uh, online listings right so yep. you've got uh you've got the first and, and the listings online were not the same as we think of now like the data was pretty crude yes but there was access for the consumers to be able to to look at homes right yeah and so uh nar puts a block to that and the DOJ comes in and bans the practice of withholding the listings from the online uh, competitors. Yeah, and I remember, so I, I, I was doing real estate in, in this period of time, and, and uh, real estate agents lost their mind yep. over this. And it's interesting, because looking back, you're like, oh yeah, that's definitely antitrust, anti-competitive, right. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. this is definitely not good behavior. But if you think about it from the standpoint of, say, NAR, where their constituency, right, the people who subscribe to them are stick and brick brokerages and real estate professionals who all wake up one day and realize I've been the gatekeeper of all this information. This is how I've provided value to the consumer, and I can no longer do that if this practice is allowed. So then I go to my union and I say, hey, look, these guys over here aren't playing fair. They're creating a different environment for all of us, which is good and competitive, mm -hmm. but that's not the way that I see it. And so all of a sudden, this happens in the early 2000s, and again, the dance continues, and the DOJ jumps in and starts enforcing uh, you know, change. Right. Of course, and change, yep. And those that refuse to change are no longer in the industry. That's right, that's right. All right, so now we're into 2008 uh, to 2018. The DOJ uh, and NRR come to an agreement yes. to cease the lawsuits or stop uh, scrutiny for a 10-year period. Yes. Uh, and then as soon as that 10-year period is over, the DOJ promptly starts suing NAR. That's right. That's right. So everybody goes back to their corners. Everybody goes back to their side of the dance, just like a junior high dance. And uh, and there's a 10 year kind of a moratorium where the DOJ says, all right, stop. And there's some real practical reasons that this happened. Uh, one of the practical reasons is that uh, the DOJ had to see if the things that they put into place were actually going to change the industry. And then, of course, NAR had needed the time to be able to uh, adopt these different changes and change their behavior. But uh, on the national scale, if you think about 2008 through, through 2018, from the perspective of the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice, not a good time to try to figure out who to focus on because you had the Great Recession, you have uh, financial institutions who have been doing some pretty bad things, you have technology, you have healthcare, you have telecommunications, you have um, you have 
all kinds of industries. You have war. Yeah, you, you just have so many things yeah. all happening uh, in this period of time where NAR and the real estate profession, quite frankly, becomes a very, very small fish in a very, very, very big pond. So this 10-year moratorium, uh, you know, none of us really remembered, uh, you know, because it's just like, okay, the, everybody's done fighting. But the reality is, is as soon as this period of time was up, we're we back get, at it. We Yep, we get back in at it, and now we got, get into the participation rule and a cooperative compensation. So these are all the lawsuits that we think of now. That's right. So in uh, September 5th, 2020, the DOJ comes back to the table, files a lawsuit, and says, uh, we are not happy with your practices still around VOWs. Mm -hmm. We're not happy with your cooperative compensation agreements, uh, and we're not happy about really uh, anti-competitive behavior that we think could cause consumers to have to pay more for real estate services. Yep. So consumer is the forefront. If we look at this as like, uh, I like your corner analogy, right? Like the NAR is fighting on our behalf and the DOJ and the uh, FTC are fighting on the consumer's behalf is the theory. Um, but we could end up in these situations where uh, the outcomes don't seem right to us because we always think of ourselves as the fiduciary and we've never yeah. done anything wrong, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, looking back at all of these changes, some of them right now, are, they're just so obvious. I, and I remember just the couple that I was a part of, like they, they didn't seem that obvious at the time. So we have to be careful of that. And this is where, you know, the echo chamber starts. I see some very, very clear ways that consumers could lose, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and just again, if you think about, if you think about what antitrust is, antitrust refers to the regulatory regulation uh, of the concentration of economic power, particularly regarding to monopolies and other anti-competitive practices. It's possible for something to be antitrust behavior in the eyes of the DOJ and still be better for the consumer. And so that's the issue, right, is, is nobody has uh, a crystal ball. Uh, we as real estate agents are pretty, uh, pretty uh, clear that we know what's best for the consumer, and it's what we do, right? Like, right. we serve consumers. But we just want to be clear that the DOJ probably feels equally as clear as to the, the reasons that they're going about this. But either way, um, one of the things that's really important to understand for this webinar is the DOJ has come out and said, we are committed to enforcing change in real estate. Yep. This is different than the class action lawsuits, and this is the reason for this webinar, because you have to be prepared, not for what's going on with those, with those lawsuits, but with these ones. So potential outcomes. Yeah, so uh, first and foremost here in Washington, we're already seeing some of these happening or we've seen them happen over the last year. The first one is the mandatory buyer's representation agreements. Yep. That rolled out January 1st. Uh, and I've been a part of quite a few meetings about that and seeing like that echo chamber play out. So are our agents already losing their mind over this? Yes. Correct, yep. Okay. Even that min minuscule change of like a mandatory buyer's representation agreement, so. yeah. Uh, listing forms, disclosing listing agents' commissions on what is offered. Uh, we're also seeing uh, buyers' agents' commission being disclosed as well uh, on websites and everything, right? Like it's transparency is being uh, enforced at the highest level. Yes. So, okay, so if you look at this, um, our business practices already align with this. Uh, Washington State and several other states already align with this. And so there can be this feeling of like, okay, that's all that's really going to happen. But you have to understand that the DOJ doesn't see this and they're not articulating this as the change that they want to see. And that's really important to understand that this is not necessarily what they're asking for. And so I want to frame this uh, as not what's good or bad, but what's easier and harder. So yeah. the easiest change we're going to see are changes like this. So if you've already had good business practices like making sure everybody you work with is in contract and has clear expectations set from a consultation, yay, high five. If you haven't, this is gonna be the minimum that I'm hard pressed to see that this is the kind of the end of it, yeah. right? So if we go and there's kind of a continuum, we go all the way to what could be hardest. Now we start ending up in this, this, this new world of real estate that we all should be prepared for. Because again, this is not popular opinion. This is not about uh, the, uh, the class action lawsuits. This is about the Department of Justice having their way. And they've been dancing now for 80 years. And they have continued to get their way towards more and more um, competitive type behaviors, right? Yeah. So that looks like listing brokerage, sharing their commis commissions with the buy side becomes illegal. Not optional, not like it's no longer common practice, but it's actually uh, no longer can it happen. And then secondly, buyer's agents only get paid by their clients 
or their client's financing. So another way of looking at it would be something like this. Yep, so seller only negotiates to pay their agent. Yes. And then buyer's agent negotiates to get their commission from their buyer. If some of you haven't sat down and really thought through this and you're seeing this for the first time, this is gonna be a shock. Yeah, absolutely. So if you see this and your first reaction is like, that's horrible, that's like, blah, blah, blah. Okay. nobody cares. Yeah. But it's like, love you, sorry. Like I'm, we're here doing this for, for people in our industry, but nobody cares. Yeah, right. Department's, Department of Justice wakes up tomorrow and says this is the playing field. You can't fight this. Yeah. So, so these things, you know, what will happen, of course, consumer experience will rebalance and we'll figure, figure it all out. But this, this could be detrimental to a good portion of people in our industry if they choose not to change. That, that's, the big, yep. that's the big takeaway, right? So agent commissions are no longer published in the MLS. Sellers, agents no longer can share commission with the buyer's agents, right? So, so this now completely separates out working with sellers, working with, working with buyers, and all the compensation, uh, and all the way down to what a title company is allowed to do and not do. Yep. Okay. So this is a really significant change. And if you are somebody who works right now exclusively uh, on listing properties, you have built the core competency that we feel like everybody in our industry is going to need, and you really have an advantage moving into this next season. If you work with buyers and sellers, or exclusively with buyers, there are some uh, skill sets that you may or may not have honed that are going to be crucial moving forward, whether you feel behaviorally um, like uh, like aligned with it or not. Right, yeah. If you are, uh, if if you love working with clients and helping clients, and you just like you're afraid to ask for what's best for you up front, like this is going to be hard. Thank you guys so much for watching, and hopefully uh, you found it to be as interesting and important for you to know all the history of of the NAR and the DOJ, um, you know, case and they're kind of how they've they've combated each other over the last hundred plus years. As always, we are here to impact empower and encourage you in all things that you do. Take care, everybody.